Hey everybody, what's up? Today is Tuesday, February 9th. Today we had the privilege of talking with Ryan Mickler. Ryan is a husband, father, Iraqi combat veteran, and the founder of Order of Man. Ryan grew up without a permanent father figure and has seen firsthand how a lack of strong, ambitious, self-sufficient men has impacted society today. He believes many of the world's most complicated problems could be solved if men everywhere learned how to be better husbands, fathers, businessmen, and community leaders. It has now become his life's mission to help men across the planet step more fully into their roles as protectors, providers, and presiders over themselves, their families, their businesses, and their communities. You can find him blogging and podcasting at Order of Man, where he is working to help men become all they were meant to be. Okay, so today we welcome on a very special guest. That's Ryan Mickler. Uh, Ryan is a husband, father, Iraqi combat veteran, and for us, uh, what we know him most of is the founder of the Order of Man podcast. Ryan, thanks for coming on, man. What's up, guys? Glad to be joining you. Looking forward to our uh, conversation today. Absolutely. And so we'll obviously let you talk a little bit about Order of Man, but from the simplest perspective that I can give right now, it's just a bunch of badass dudes that are there to help hold each other accountable to be the best man that they can possibly be. And if you listen to your podcast or really any of the content that you put out, one of the things that we know is that there's a huge difference from actually being what is a man and a masculine man, as opposed to just being a male. Can you, so starting us off there, why don't you talk about that? What's the difference between being a man and a male? Yeah, I mean, male is just biology. That really, that's all it is. It's just biology. Uh, so you, you look at my sons. I've got three sons. I've got a little daughter as well, but I've got three sons. They're males. They're not men. They're, they're boys, right? Because they have the yeah. biology. They have the chromosomes. Uh, but to be a man, it takes much more than that. You know, we don't expect our young men, our boys to be men uh, because they're dependent and they're learning and they're growing and they're trying to figure things out and they don't have a whole lot of accountability, responsibility. But uh, when, when a male learns to take responsibility for himself, uh, he learns to be accountable for himself and other people, that's when he becomes a man. And it's, it has nothing to do with age, by the way. This is why you saw 100 years ago, you'd see 13, 14, 15 year old young boys that were acting more like men than some 30-year-olds. I know. There was a story I came across uh, from an organization, a company called Lodge Cast Iron, I believe. Uh, and it was in, I want to say 1860s, somewhere in there. Yep. This young boy had just lost his father and he went, he left his mother and his siblings to go look for work at the age of 15 and ended up going into Pennsylvania and worked his way down the United States and eventually ended up in uh, South America and then worked his way back up into North America and bought a forge. And this is a very cool story, but just an example of how a 15-year-old young man can actually become a man relative to 30-year-old men that we see, or males, I should say, see living in mommy and daddy's basement, um, mooching off of their parents for what they should be providing for themselves. So that's those are the biggest differentiating factors. Of course, there's a lot that goes into it, but at its root, that's what it is. Absolutely, absolutely. I think a lot of it has to just do with accountability, the accountability aspect, and just um, kind of owning your shit. And that's a lot of what uh, the order of man is. You've got, I think, seventy seven thousand members on Facebook alone. Is that right? Yeah, I mean that's our Facebook group. Like we've got seventy seven thousand guys there. We've got another eighty thousand on our page. We've got one hundred and fifty thousand on Instagram, two hundred thousand on YouTube. I mean, it's we've got. I, I think I want to say probably close to thirty million downloads on the podcast. It's insane. Like I would never would have imagined this would be the case five six years ago. Right. Yeah. And can you give us? Uh, I guess we've talked about it a little bit, but give us a little bit more insight into the Order of Man, that group, that accountability. Obviously, you started it for awesome selfish reasons to better yourself. And it just yeah. turned into something that everybody else ended up enjoying and everybody else could learn from as well. Yeah. I mean, that's really what it was. I've never positioned myself as, as a man who has everything figured out, or I'm the epitome of, of masculinity. I'm certainly not, you know, I'm on, I'm on the path. I'm trying to figure stuff out. Um, I get impatient with my kids. My wife and I get into arguments. I eat more chips and salsa than maybe I should. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm not like, I don't have everything dialed in, you know? And so yeah. and nobody does really. So my goal when I started Order of Man was to be able to have conversations with men who did have a lot of this stuff dialed in. And fortunately, I've been able to have conversations with guys like Steve Rinella and Tim Kennedy, Jocko, uh, David Goggins. I mean, the lineup of guys that have joined us on the podcast is phenomenal. But that's a testament to the fact that men want to hear from other men who have this stuff figured out. And uh, we grew very rapidly uh, right when I took off. I had another podcast before this one 
Uh, but Order of Man took off very, very rapidly. And here we are six years later with millions of downloads and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people impacted by the work we're doing. So I'm, I'm honored to have created the movement, but I feel like I'm a very small part of what we're actually doing here. And I actually find that super cool about you because something that it, it always resonates every time I listen to one of your podcasts or see a post is you, you say that you're not perfect. You're not that person. Like, hey, I'm not the, I'm not the answer to all your, your problems. I'm just here doing the same thing you're doing, trying to, to make that step forward. And when it comes to accountability that you talk about in, in everything we've spoke on here, why is it that you think that in this generation, you know, our generation, that nobody's held accountable anymore? Like, what is it? Is it just like they're sucking on mommy's titty or they've been given participation trophies their whole life? Because I, there's nothing that bothers me more than somebody's like, you know, just try real hard or give it your best, you know, just go have fun. It's like, no, fuck that. Like, I'm here to fucking win. So, like, what, what has happened in life that, that created this? Life is easy. Like, you, like, when's the last time any of us struggled? I mean, yeah, maybe we had a hard time making the mortgage payment or, you know, we got laid off or we had to deal with a minor medical setback. But, I mean, really, for the most part, and generally, when's the last time any of us struggled? Yeah, true. That's a good thing, though, right? Like, that, the, 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 the luxuries of modernity are, are, are very nice. Like, I enjoy, just before I came in to do this podcast, you know, I'm in Maine, it's snowing, it's cold, I turned up the heat. Like, I enjoy being able to go over to a wall and say, I'm cold and then it will, the heat will kick on and then I'm not cold anymore. Like I enjoy that. Yeah. But Don't have to go chop also wood. It, right. Exactly. But also it creates a level of complacency and comfort so much so that we make up dumb shit to worry about. Like, why are we arguing about gender? Like a hundred years ago, we weren't arguing about that because everybody's worried about staying alive. Yeah. So we as human beings need, and I think this is specifically true of men. We need to find things to push against and push on that are meaningful and significant. And if we don't have those challenges, then like I said, we'll make up dumb shit to worry about and we'll bicker and we'll moan and we'll bitch over things that actually don't matter. So what I would suggest is rather than worrying about those things, we actually find meaningful, purpose-driven challenge to, to dive into head first so that we can create the meaning and purpose and fulfillment and satisfaction that comes with this. But yeah, I mean, our, our younger generations are not being introduced to that. You know, there's no, there's no real consequence for failing, no. whether it's in school, whether it's in sports, whether it's in your job. I mean, think about that. You get laid off from a job. What do you do? You go collect unemployment benefits. Yeah. Well, that's nice. So right. I don't have to work. Or even in the midst of COVID, like if you didn't prepare a plan, and look, I know there's people that are in difficult financial circumstances, but if you didn't prepare a plan, here, the government will give you $600 back of the thousands and thousands of dollars you paid in taxes up to this point. Yeah, and this I- There's no I, consequence. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with, with everything that happened with COVID. I mean, I looked at that as like, you know, I'm not in the position to even receive the stimulus money, you know? So why is it that you weren't prepared that now I'm going to sit and bail you out of your problems? Like, that's like the farthest thing from being a provider there is, is somebody providing for you, you know, as a man- you know, I, I expect my wife to be at home, take care of the kids, and I'm going to come home and I'm going to provide the food that goes on the table, the house that's over their head. So I, I just, I, to me, there's such a, a distance between those two things right now, because there's, there's people that are so far left that they just expect it nowadays. And that also kind of goes into my next question of that you talked about is we're worrying about gender, right? So there's males, there's females. Now there's, you know, transgender males and transgender females. So how do you feel about, you know, we, we get a new president and one of the first things he does is sign an executive order saying, if you're a transgender male, you can go compete in female sports. I mean, to me, you're, you're a male. And what, what makes these people think it's all right to, to make that transition? I mean, they can do what they want. You know, I mean, if, if, some, if, if a man believes that he's a woman, okay. I mean, I, I, that's weird to me, but okay. If a woman thinks that he's a man, or she's a man, I should say, uh, then, okay, well, that's fine. But when it begins to impact me or other people, I think we need to start worrying about this and st need to start having these discussions. There was a uh, article that I had read that uh, they're going to start teaching this concept of transgenderism as, a, as some sort of normal thing uh, to kindergartners in either the state of California or Washington, somewhere on the, the West Coast. I mean, that's a problem. Yeah. Like, I, I, my kids aren't in the public school system for a reason. 
And, and that's actually part of the reason. But then also you have these young ladies who have worked their asses off to compete, to potentially secure college scholarships for higher education, uh, to pursue something that's meaningful and purpose-driven. Look, there's women who could kick my ass at certain sports, but, they're o- but the overwhelming majority of the time, and, and generally, you could take the average woman, you could place her against the average man, and the man is always going to win in a competitive sport. Yeah. I'm talking in generalities. Now right. we can find the fringe outliers, yeah, right? Yeah, of For course. Sure. Right. But generally, that's how it is. So to even begin to believe or think that men don't have a competitive advantage when it comes to beating women in physical competition, that's asinine. Yeah. And it strips these young ladies of opportunities that I think we should actually be providing for them. Or not, I shouldn't say providing, that's not right, but uh, creating, uh, fostering, maybe is the right word, fostering mm-hmm. these opportunities for them to thrive and grow and get higher education and excel and do the things that they want to they uh, pursue. And you did touch on that your kids aren't in the, the public school system. And my, my kids are just getting to that point where we're going to have to make that decision of, of what are we going to do? You know, we, we didn't send my daughter to preschool just for the pure fact of her having to wear a mask every day. Like, I, I just don't agree with it. I didn't want to do it. Um, so we, we actually are, are thinking about going the private school route. And I know yours are homeschooled. What made you make that decision to go for the, the homeschooling over, over a private school with more conservative views than the, the liberal views that are just being thrown upon these kids nowadays in the public school system? Yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot of factors, of course. The fact that we moved to a new state and we weren't real familiar with the area was one of the reasons. Uh, but then also I see some of the agenda that's being pushed and I'm not interested in indoctrinating my children that way. I feel like I'm, I'm well qualified as is my wife to be able to teach our children. I just spent a half an hour with my son on some math assignments and there was a few where I'm like, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> and we had to, we had to figure it out, right? But we could, we could, we figured it out. It was not a big deal. And there was some things that he showed me and things I showed him, but then we can incorporate our own curriculum as well. You know, we spend, my oldest son and I particularly, we, we train every day. We train jujitsu every single day. There is not a day that goes by where we don't train together. And that's actually part of their quote unquote curriculum. You know, so there's a lot of reasons for this, but I really see the path of the public schooling system deviating and going away from the values that I hold dear, the values that I espouse. And I'll be damned if I let my children become indoctrinated to the doctrine of popular culture, as I've dubbed it. It's just not something I'm interested in. And I have a moral obligation, responsibility, sure, that my children are teed up and set up for success in the best possible way. And there's not a soul on earth who can do it better than I can do it for them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I find that super cool. I see what you're doing with your your son on the canoe. And I mean, just to have that relationship hands-on, you know, I've been very fortunate in my life to spend a lot of time with my dad. And I know some of these guys haven't had that opportunity. So maybe they have something they might want to ask about about that experience. Yeah, so I mean, I know one of the reasons I, and Brad turned me on to your podcast initially. Um, and one of the reasons it really resonated with me was your story and your upbringing, the fact that you grew up without a father, uh, and I actually never really talked about this on the podcast before, but I had a very similar upbringing. My dad split before I was born. Honestly, I have like no ill will against the person because I truly believe that like where I am now was a right path for me. And I know I wouldn't be on that path if I did have him in my life. But right. um, also that being said, I feel like, especially someone in an extreme case like yours, like you took it, ran with it, and you kicked fucking ass, right? There's so many people that fall into this victim mentality of life happens to me instead of like I have the actions and the ability to control what happens in my life or like I can I can carve out my own path, right? So many people take that and use it as a crutch and it cripples them, right? And, and they blame everything, all of their problems that they have on something that's an external factor. So do you know, like, and I'm sure you've seen this or heard this question a million times, but like, how did you deal with that? Like, how did you decide like, okay, I'm the motherfucking man of my life. Like, I'm not going to let this cripple me, even though it was obviously your dad wasn't there. You had a couple stepdads and they obviously weren't good role models. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't always like this for me. There was a lot of times where I did blame other people, specifically my father and stepdads and other people in my life for the position that I had found myself in. You know, that, that's a very easy trap to fall into. It's convenient. It's laziness. That's really what it is. It's lazy. You know, if it's my dad's fault or my mom's fault or this person's fault or that person's fault or the government or the economy or the president or whoever, yep. then well, I don't have to take any of that burden of responsibility for myself. 
So I had actually bought into that narrative. Uh, and long story short, it actually created a lot of problems and challenges in, in our marriage, my wife and I. Uh, we were, we had just had a son. He was about one years old and, or one at the time. And uh, we got into some arguments and long story short, we decided that, you know, we're, we're going to separate. And when I say we, I mean her, you know, she wanted a separation at least at a minimum. And I remember driving down the road and, and I thought to myself, you know, this marriage is, is actually over. And I didn't want to wrestle with that because I still loved her. I still wanted to be with her. So I didn't want to wrestle with the idea that our marriage would be over. But I remember in that moment, and it was a catalyst and a, and a critical moment of my life where I said to myself, you know, if this marriage is over, then I'm just going to become the next best catch for the woman who's going to eventually come into my life. And at that moment, I really began to take responsibility for my life. Because uh, up to that time, what I was doing is blaming her and why was she doing this and why was she not doing what a quote unquote good wife should do? And why didn't she appreciate all the sacrifices and everything? You know, all the things that we as men say about our wives, sure. right? Because we all go through this. Yeah. So, so I started taking responsibility and lo and behold, she started to take notice and she was very attracted to the idea that I was able to take responsibility. Now, I'm not saying she wasn't responsible for some of it. And, and if she were in here having this podcast with us, she would say the same thing, that were, there were things that she needed to work on and improve as well. Uh, but really, as I began to take on that burden of, of responsibility, and that's what it is, it's, it's a burden, it's heavy, it, it, it's a load to bear, um, I started to transform my life. And I recognized that the problems that I had were dissipating, and I was starting to achieve more success, not only on the marriage front, but within my financial planning practice at the time and my physical health. And I really realized through the results I was experiencing, uh, that taking responsibility is the best way. You know, I wasn't satisfied with what I had been achieving. Uh, there, there's a, a scripture, and I don't know which scripture it is, but it's in, in the Bible, and it's it, the, the whole premise is, by, by their fruits ye shall know thee. So if you want to know if what you're doing is successful, just look at what it's producing. If you want to know if your workout regimen is working, are you losing weight? Are you getting strong? Are you becoming, you know, better, hardened? Uh, if you want to know if you're, if, if you're doing the right things as a husband, ask yourself how your marriage is going. If it's not going well, then the answer is no, you're not doing the right things. The fruit is bad. Therefore, the tree is sour, right? So, uh, you know, again, I, I know it's tempting for people to blame other people. And the trap is that there is a lot of responsibility on other people's parts. Like having my father around or not around actually does impact my life. It changes my life. The economy plays a part in your life. The boss that you blame all your problems on could actually be an asshole. And that's the trap, is that because there might be an element of truth to it, you're assigning all of the burden and responsibility yep. and not shouldering at least some level of it. But if you aren't willing to take responsibility and you assume that it's always somebody else's fault and 100% their responsibility, then what you're doing is you're simultaneously playing a weak position. You're making yourself weak and inferior because what you're doing is you're saying, hey, look, you know, if it's Matt's fault that I'm not getting what I want out of my career, then I have to wait for you to change in order for me to have what I want out of my career. It's a very passive, weak way of approaching life. Uh, and it's what millions and millions of people do and they can't seem to figure out why they're not getting what they want. Right. And I love that about the the whole order of man and like, Again, the accountability aspect. So we started this podcast, started as a book club. Turned out there was just four to five like-minded guys that wanted to get better. And we are obsessed with it, right? Like we absolutely fucking love it. And it was just like, I don't think, you know, I don't think any of us have really had anything like that before. So can you talk to us about why it's so important for men to have these tribes that push us forward? Yeah, men, men are interesting in, in, in that standpoint. Um, and there's a big distinction, I think, between the way that women congregate and men congregate. Uh, women are more relational. So as they're working through, and again, I'm talking in generalities, but as they're working through their issues and the things they're dealing with, they're usually, if you look at the way they're even physically structured, they're face-to-face, -face, right? Face-to-face, -face, you know, looking at each other, discussing, talking, hashing out of the ideas. But if you look at men, look at yourselves. Like you're not face to face, you're shoulder to shoulder, right? And what are you doing? You're working towards shoulder to shoulder, a common objective or against a common enemy. And that's why combat is, is typically uh, something that men are more attracted to. That's why generally speaking, 
uh, competitive sports is something that we're more attracted to. So when it comes to men congregating, what we need to do as men is find things that we can do that are challenging, that have purpose and meaning, that are tough and difficult. And then we weave the conversations in amongst those difficult things that we're doing versus women who can just sit down on the couch and talk. Men need to actually be out doing something shoulder to shoulder against a common enemy or towards a common objective. Uh, and when you do that, what you're going to realize is that the guy next to you is either soft. So you either need to f- get him figured out mm-hmm. and dialed in or replace him. Cause I can't go to battle with somebody who's soft. Uh, or you might figure out that maybe you're soft relative to the guy next to you and you need to get your ass in gear and improve and be inspired and grow and learn from these individuals. And we play both roles, right? There's a lot of men in my life who are significantly better than me at things. And I'm the weak one. I'm the weak link. Right. And so I learn from these guys and I, and I recognize that that's humility. And I recognize that. And there's other situations where I'm the strong link and I acknowledge that. And I assume the role of leader or coach or mentor Yep, but together we we get better. Again, it's a whole law of averages, right? You know, it's you're the the average of the five people you associate yourself most with. Like you said, in some cases you're the weak link, but if you're in a good group of people and you've got a good mindset, then your goal is to be getting up to their level, uh, and then vice versa. If or you're, better, yeah. or better, you no know, better, right? Like, yeah. okay, here's you know, I I look at guys that do podcasting and think, okay, well, this guy's got a successful podcast. I don't want to be as good as him. I want to dominate him. I want to be oh, better yeah. than him. Yeah. You know, so. And something I, you I, said that I, I want to ask you about is, because we've talked about this before, of like, you know, do you want to be, it, you have your circle of, of men or your tribe. And like you said, there's there's one that's always at the bottom and you need to decide of how are we going to determine if we're going to make him better or if we're going to replace him. Like, can you talk about that a little bit? Because I feel like that's probably a little bit of a touchy or sensitive area to those people that are on the bottom. Because we, we've talked about it before of, you know, do you want to be the top one in your group or do you want to be, you know, the lowest one that's going to work their way up, if that makes any sort of sense. Yeah. I mean, I always want to be the lowest one who's going to work himself up because then I know and you graduate, right? Yeah. So, I mean, take it from an objective metric like uh, like income, for example. You know, I want to be surrounded by people who are making more money than I do. Exactly. Do, then I'm going to learn strategies, skills, ideas, concepts, business plans that are going to help me make more money. That's what I want. If I'm making the most amount of money in the room, although that's flattering and I feel like, you know, like, like I'm a man because I make more than anybody else, that isn't really actually helping me get any better. So it is touchy when you're talking about adding people, removing people from your circle, you know, like we don't want to, we don't want to talk about that. That's uncomfortable. Or maybe you've had some friendships that uh, you've been hanging out with this guy since high school and you used to get in trouble and chase the same girls and play on the same sports teams. And now you're 40 years old and you're like kind of just stuck with this guy who's not actually progressing. We have these weird ideas of loyalty. Like the fact of the matter is, is that some relationships you're just going to outgrow. That's the reality of the situation. And it's not to say that I won't give somebody a hand up who needs it, but if they aren't, I heard this a long time ago when I was doing my financial planning practice, the guy, my mentor at the time said, if they're not as at least as interested in their growth as you are, you can't do anything for them. Yep. Yeah, I agree. So let me say that again. If they're not at least as interested in their own development as you are, there's nothing you can do for them. And I've had people in my life who aren't as excited about their own growth as I see you know, like I look at people, I'm like, man, I see so much potential in you. And then we want to rescue them. We want to save them. We want to white knight and we want to get them to where they are. But if they're not interested in it, you know, we, we can still be acquaintances. We can still talk. If you have an occasional question, I'm happy to do that. But you're not coming in my circle. Yeah. I can't have that in my circle. I think that's such a great way to put it too, because I think everybody initially just thinks, okay, if somebody's not at my level, I just got to cut them, right? Like the the no, the, ex- so. the extreme the extreme versions, right? But, right. but to say like that, again- we're all about self-development. We're all about trying to improve ourselves. If somebody is at a lower level than you and they're in, within your friend group, it's a, it's different if they have that level of excitement about getting better, right? Well, think about it this way. Let's take, you're talking about extremes, so let's take an extreme. Is my, is, are any of my children as good as me at anything? No. So should I cut them out of my life? No. <laughs> no. no, because my role is their father. My role is to lead 
is to foster growth and development. It's to get them to be better. It's to help them improve. It's to put them in environments and situations that are going to be challenging so they can test themselves and figure out where they're weak and where they're strong and how to improve and get better. So yeah, we're not going to cut. I'm, I'm not talking about cutting people out of your life. Although you may need to at some point if they never show any sign of progression and growth, not your kids, okay? Let me be clear on that. <laughs> I'm not saying that. Because, um, you know, we're stuck with our children, right? But, but even still, you know, like I'll be, I'll be straight up. If one of my kids is 25 years old and he isn't out of the house and he's not going to school and he doesn't have a job and he's hooked on drugs or he's drinking or he's, you know, whatever he's doing, you're out, dude. Yeah. Like you're gone. Yeah. You know, because you're at the stage now where you— you should be past that. And hopefully I did a good enough job to get you to that point. But at some point I got to clip the wings and let you go. Yeah, so, I think, I mean, I, I think this goes a lot to what I was talking about before is I don't know what's wrong with the, I feel like parents are the biggest enablers in their child's, you know, unsuccesses where they're not able to strive is because they've they've had this person over them like, oh, you had a rough time here. Here's a hundred bucks or, oh, you know, you got kicked out of your house. Here, come stay with me. And instead it's like, no, yeah. dude, you're you're an adult. You know, it's time to start being the man you're supposed to be. And I think by being that enabler, they never grow out of that stage because there's always that victim mentality of, well, somebody's going to be here to bail me out of the next situation. Well, you know, there's an interesting thing I've been kind of toying around with my in my brain about that concept. You know, a lot of the times people will say things like, oh, I just care about them. I just love them. I don't want them to suffer, that kind of thing. Yeah. Right? I call bullshit. 100%. That's not what it is. What it actually is, is you don't want to suffer. Yep. You That's don't it. want to have an uncomfortable conversation. You don't want it to be awkward because you are weak and you can't deal with it. It has nothing to do with the person or the child that you're trying to quote unquote save. You're trying to save and salvage yourself. Yep. Because if you really cared about that individual, whether it was a colleague or a coworker, an employee, a client, a child, then you would say and do exactly what needed to be said and done for that person to progress. So don't give me this bullshit that you care more about them. You care about yourself and you're being selfish by not doing what needs to be done so those people can thrive. And I'm the type of person too, where after this podcast is over, I hope one of these guys is like, dude, that was that was dumb of you or you know, you could have improved here because I want the criticism. I want somebody to tell me where I messed up or where I could have been better because I'm not gonna grow if somebody doesn't tell me that. And I, I feel like that's what's great, you know, on the Order of Man page on Facebook. I mean, you'll get on there and say, guys, come on, like the stuff you're talking about, like you're better than even asking this question. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, like, let's step it up. This page is here to really be a man, not to just voice your, your bitches or your moans. Like, go out there and fucking do what you need to do. Uh, and look, there's a time and a place to, to air out those grievances or to talk about issues that you're dealing with. And I think personally, with a band of brothers that you've developed a relationship with is a great place to do that. Um, you know, going to a Facebook group or going to your wife, that's a trap a lot of guys fall into. And they'll just insistently like complain and gripe and moan without posing any solutions. Isn't that a rule? And you're undermining your authority. Isn't that a rule on your page? If somebody's going to pose a problem, yeah. they have to try to come up with one solution. Have a solution. That's awesome. Yeah, and guys will, some guys will say things like, well, if they knew the answer, they wouldn't be asking the question. <laughs> That's not true. You know, how, how many people ask questions they already know the answer to? Because there's a couple of reasons. One, they don't like the conclusion they came up with. So they're hoping they come up with a different one. Or two, they're hoping that other people will justify their poor habits or their, their poor performance. Yeah. Right. So we ask all questions all the time that we know the answer to, hoping that we'll get a different answer than the one we already know to be true. Right. Plus, we want to get these guys in the mindset of figuring out their own shit, right? Like, yeah. like I don't want you to complain. Okay, so, you're, so you had a bad day or you got laid off or your wife's mad at you or, you know, you're, you're fat or whatever, like whatever. So like, what are you going to do about it? Well, I don't know. Okay, at least give me a thought. Like surely you've thought about something. Like something crossed your mind, hopefully. No, nothing. Okay, well then you're not ready. There's nothing I could tell you where you would actually be in the state and the position of being ready. I had, a, I had a guy come to me a long time ago in the financial planning business. I'd been in the business for probably, I don't know, four or five years. And the guy comes to me, young kid, and he says, hey, you know, I'm just really trying to improve and get better in this thing. And I was happy to help him because I had somebody help me get me to the position I was. And I said, yeah, what can we talk about? And we probably spent, I don't know, it could have been 45 minutes or an hour talking about what he was going through and 
how he can improve. And I started offering his suggestions on things he could do. And I remember vividly, and I'll never forget it. He's like, no, I've already tried that. I'd give him another uh-huh. suggestion. No, I've already tried. No, I've, I'm not. Well, it doesn't work for me. I didn't, I'm like, look, stop, time out. Why the hell are you asking me questions? If you've tried everything that I'm giving to you, you haven't tried everything because it's yeah. worked for me. And if you do it, it will work for you. So like clearly, how about this? How about you just tell me what you want me to tell you? And I'll just say that. <laughs> and then I can go about my business. And then you can feel good about what you're doing. Save some time. Yeah. yeah totally. That, that's something that just really gets underneath me is when somebody comes and asks for help and then you tell them just like you're saying it's like what the fuck did you even yeah. waste my time for it's like if you have the right. fucking answers go be fucking the man you're supposed to be don't come here and complain to me i don't got time right. for that yeah hey Ryan, i got a question for you how how often do you audit your circle and audit your rituals and routines i wouldn't say that i have a formal audit of my circle my routines yes but my circle i wouldn't ha- i don't have a formal audit uh, but I am asking myself, who is in my circle? Who do I want to meet? I legitimately have a list. It's on my phone. I don't even know. My phone's over there. A list of people that I want in my circle. So what, what kind of value am I going to add to these people's lives? How am I going to connect with them? Um, I have people that I've connected with via the podcast or other events and things I've been with that I want to maintain relationships with. And I'm constantly pulling those names up. Uh, I've got a, uh, content management or a contact management system where I'll go through and it'll tell me, you know, you haven't talked to this individual for a period of time. So reach out to this guy or, you know, I'll see an article that highlights somebody that I'm maybe loosely connected with and I'll take a screenshot and text him or email him and say, Hey, I came across this really cool. Good job. You inspire me. Keep up the good work. So I'm constantly looking for ways to elevate uh, my circle. Uh, as far as systems goes, I'm man, I'm a system driven guy. So every single morning, in fact, I've got it right here. Every single morning, I'll go in, I'll write out my tasks, I'll write everything I need to do. As I'm doing it throughout the day, I check it off the list. I actually recap at the end of every night. So when this is done, my day will be, my work day will be over. Uh, so before I sign out and everything, I'll go through and I'll review, okay, what did I get done? What didn't I do? What do I need to improve? How can I make this better? I'll go in and I'll listen to podcasts. Like I'll listen to this podcast not because I like to hear myself talk, although I do, but I'll <laughs> listen to this podcast because I want to get better. So I'll, I'll, I'll evaluate it and I'll say, okay, well, what did I miss? Or what question that I, did they ask that I didn't quite answer? Or maybe I answered it, but I didn't answer it or it wasn't communicated the way that I wanted to share it. So I'm very critical in a positive, constructive way about my performance on podcasts, phone calls, conversations, workouts, everywhere that I show up. Yeah. And I think that's a super important way to think, but honestly, it's one of the hardest things to do, whether it's on a podcast or you're recording a sales call or you're recording yourself play a sport or give a speech, right? Because we're our biggest critics. So a lot of times it is the most difficult thing to sit there and watch ourselves do it, but it's the best possible thing that we can do because nobody's going to be able to tell us what better to do than ourselves when we're watching ourselves. And yeah, that's true. But I will push back on what you said. Uh, you said it's the hardest or the diff- most difficult thing you could do. Um, I- I'm very careful with the language that I use. And-, and I made a post about this on Instagram or Facebook the other day. And-, and the language you tell yourself is very important. So if I had a guy, he- he's a friend of mine. His name's John. He's-, he's been with us for five years now. And I made this post. And he said, oh, that's a-, that's a hard habit to break. And I said, no, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That language is not serving you. You're saying it's hard and you're probably in some capacity making it harder than it needs to be. So I I understand where you're coming from. I just think we need to be very careful of our language. It is challenging for sure. It is, it is, it, it has that element to it, but it's also very valuable and it's a great learning opportunity and it's a great way to improve and that's the language we should be using when we're faced with things that might be challenging for us i yeah no you're right i agree 100 percent. i actually saw that i had that written down the use your language and your thoughts to serve you not to hinder you right so yeah yeah it, like it's if a you mindset say, oh shift. this is hard or you know even my son will say oh dad you know this is going to be a hard day yeah you're damn right it is because you just said it was going to be a hard day <laughs> so everything you do throughout the day is going to be harder than it needs to be because you said it was going to be a hard day yep and now yep, look chill. i'm not saying that we need to be oblivious to what's going on yeah like i'm not saying that you need to bury your head in the sand and pretend everything is just 
you know, wonderful fairy tales and unicorns. Like you can be realistic, but still frame it in a way that's actually going to serve you, not hinder you. Yep. And something that you mentioned is you you have your list of people that, you know, you want to associate with, you want to be with. Who Who's your number one? Who's that, who's that guy or that girl that you want to have on their podcast or be associated with to be in your circle? Man, I've got like from for the podcast, I mean, I've got Jordan Peterson, Joe Rogan, Mike Rowe, Keanu Reeves would be a badass podcast. Like I've got, I've got <laughs> probably a hundred plus names on on that on that list. And you know, some of the guys that I have on the podcast I really resonate with. Uh Tim Kennedy is one. We just released his podcast, not well, it was as of this recording, it was released today. Yeah. Love uh, that. that was an awesome one. Yeah. It was so, it, honestly, it was one, people ask me all the time, what's your favorite episode? And that I think is my favorite episode. What he's doing is awesome. Was, I mean, I couldn't agree more with what he's doing with the school he's starting up. I mean, that's like, that's yeah. what the world needs to get to be. And we need to have more. Definitely. Fun. I mean, I thought it was awesome. Yeah. So, you know, in that case, Tim, somebody that I want to have a connection with, that I want to maintain the relationship, that I want to foster that and add value to his life and, and become a friend. Uh so, and then there's other podcast guests that I have on where, you know, it's a great podcast, but you know, I don't, I don't have any sort of connection or affinity that way. And that's fine too. But yeah, I mean, there's people everywhere and there, and there's a, a million people that nobody would ever know yeah. right, that I want to make connections with and, 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 and be friends with for different reasons. You know, maybe this guy is uh, very good at jujitsu and, and he's going to teach me and coach me and mentor me. And that's the extent of our relationship. And, other guys will come to my house and spend time with me and my family. And that's the extent of our relationship. And so I, I, I can compartmentalize like this person's here for this reason. This person's here for this reason. And I also recognize that there's chapters, you know, I, I don't have any sort of strange idea of, of, of lifelong loyalty to individuals just because we happen to be connected at some point. I think of that when it comes to employment too, you know, you work for an employer I do the work, you pay me. At the end of every day, our contract starts over. It ends yeah. and it starts over the next day. And I don't owe you anything outside of that. And you don't owe me anything outside of that. Yeah. And that realistic view is, I think, served me pretty well. Hey, hey right. Um, when did you start doing jujitsu? Uh, I started roughly three, three and a half years ago. And I did it for like a week. And because I got invited to a jujitsu camp. And so I, I thought, well, I might, might as well go take a few lessons. So I went and did a few uh, classes and did this week-long jujitsu camp, got my ass kicked, uh, and then stopped doing jujitsu. And then the next time the camp came up, I started again about a week before so I could, you know, Get warmed and up. went to the camp. Yeah, and got my ass kicked again. But after that camp was over, I decided to stick with it. So I, I've been doing it solid for at least four days a week for two and a half years or so now. And, and what do you think, what, what's like your biggest takeaway from it? Why did, why did you, why were you so attracted to it? And why, why do you stick with it? What keeps you going back? There's a lot. I mean, the physicality of it, I don't, outside of that and, and maybe just training in the gym and doing some strength training, there isn't a whole lot of opportunity for men to fight other men. Yeah. <laughs> like there's value in that. Yeah. You know, there's value in, I'm going to go as hard and as smart as I can against you. And you're going to go as hard and smart as you can against me. And we're going to see who's better. Yeah. And you're going to learn stuff along the way. Totally. And he's going to teach you actually how to beat him, mm -hmm. which is an interesting concept too, right? So you, so you I and I that. are rolling, let's say, and I get you, I catch you. And then I'm going to tell you how not to get caught in that next time or how you can attack me. So I'm actually teaching you how to hurt me. That's a really weird and interesting concept. But this actually goes back to the conversation that we were having earlier about men working towards something shoulder to shoulder, common enemy, common objective. Uh, so having that physicality is very important. It's a good outlet for me. But there's also a, an immense value in it in that I have to be 100% focused. You know, it's, it's very easy for me and especially my personality to get distracted with everything that's going on from the conversation to, hey, I got to get this list done and I got my phone, phone over here buzzing. I got people probably emailing me. I've got opportunities being presented. And so it's hard for me to stay focused on one thing. But in jujitsu... I'm not thinking about the emails. I'm not thinking about the podcast. I'm not, if I did, I'd be in trouble. I'm thinking about that thing alone, trying to be strategic, trying to be smart, trying to improve my physicality. Um, and it's, it's been awesome, man. I love it. There's a lot of tangible benefits and there's a lot of things that, that would be difficult to describe unless you were involved yeah. to some degree. Do you well, guys train jujitsu or martial arts? So, so yeah, I've, I've actually dabbled. I, 
I, I don't train, <laughs> but yes, I've dabbled in it. And, uh, you know, I've done, I've, I've done just about Mu- Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu are probably my favorite. Yeah. I like, uh, Muay Thai more for the workout aspect. The Jiu Jitsu, um, for me was, I, I felt it almost instantly when I, when I went through my first full class, not my free trial class, you know, 30, 40 minutes. I felt, I felt myself be a little bit more confident and not just like in a, like in a confrontational situation, but even at work, um, even at work, like, you know, when I'm negotiating, um, you know, I I just feel myself, I'm just a little bit more sharp and a little bit more confident in my speaking. It just, I see how it carries over. And that's why I was interested to see if that's one of the main reasons why you've stuck with it. Like what, what are, so? how does it spill over into your, your life? And were you, were you in the financial services industry when you started? Um, no, I think, no. No, because okay. I I sold my financial planning practice years ago, um, and like I said, I've been I've been doing Order of Man for six years now. Yeah. So I started jujitsu after Order of Man. Okay, yeah, I was just interested to see like, do you think it helped you level up, or do you? I mean, today even with the Order oh, of Man, oh, hundred percent, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. You know, you talk about that level of confidence, and anytime you're going to do something difficult, you're going to feel better when it's over, right? So you go into gym and you go into class and. You know, you roll around for an hour and a half. Or you know, there's been times where I don't, I don't actually want to go in. I like it, but I'm like, I don't want to go in today. And I do it, and I feel better. Yeah. You know, and then everything else throughout the day is easier because I overcame that first hard obstacle, which is getting out of bed on the right time, going into class. You know, being in, put in, in in compromising and difficult situations, uh, and and overcoming it. And we take pride and satisfaction in that. That's a funny thing about confidence is. There's a lot of people who believe, and I've, I've heard these people talk and ask me questions about this, that some men are just inherently more confident than others. And that's, that's not true. Confidence is earned, and it's earned by overcoming things that you didn't previously think yourself capable of. Absolutely. You, you know, you can be arrogant, you can be egotistical, you can be prideful, and all of that can be manufactured. But confidence is not a manufactured thing. Like, it is a genuine it's manifestation of yeah. difficult. It's not even a skill. It's just, it's the result of doing hard things and getting better at it. Yeah, I think MLH says uh, you develop confidence by keeping promises to yourself. So whether it's little promises yeah. throughout the day of your task or big promises, and that's goals that you're going to be able to hit. The more you are true to yourself and keep those promises to yourself, the more confidence you inherently gain. You know what's funny about Ed? Um, Ed's phenomenal. I uh, I used to listen to Ed when I was in the financial services industry. And this is when I really started getting my financial services on track. I would listen to him between going to appointments on CDs. I'd pop a CD in. <laughs> and I remember my wife telling me one day, uh, I was I was talking with her about something. She's like, you sound like Ed Milet. And this was probably... <laughs> This is probably eight, nine years ago. So yeah, he's he's amazing. It's yeah. funny. It's funny how that language just spills over. You know, uh, you, you you. Well, and that goes to what we were saying earlier about who you surround yourself with. Yeah. You're going to start sounding like these Absolutely. people. You're going to start doing what they do. You're going to behave like them. You're going to think like them. You're going to perform like them. So yeah, it's true. So I got I got one more controversial question for you. Um, you, you spoke okay. about this a little bit before that you know felons aren't allowed to to vote. You know to you know dictate the future of our country because of bad choices that they've made. How do you feel about people who, who aren't contributing, who aren't paying their taxes that still have that privilege to vote? Like, do you think that's something that should be revoked from them? I mean, I know obviously that's never going to happen, but it's like, you know, these people aren't contributing to society. So here they are, you know, waiting for their next handout that they're going to vote for. It's an interesting question. It's one that I have thought about, although I haven't spent a lot of time pondering it. But, you know, I mean, look, why would I want an individual who doesn't contribute to the betterment of society to be voting for the laws and rules and regulations we live by? Yeah. I mean, isn't that the same philosophy behind a felon not being able to vote? Exactly. Like they've, they've relinquished their, their right to be able to vote because they've proven that they're not capable of adhering to the rules that we've all set forth and agreed to live by. So, I mean, I'm not going to come out and say directly that, no, they shouldn't be able to vote because— you know, there was a time in my life where I wasn't making any money yeah. um, and, and I felt like I, I wanted to vote. But yeah, it is an interesting, an interesting consideration and something that I think we ought to spend a lot of time. Look, here, regardless of what it is, I think the answer is education. You know, the answer is 
teaching, coaching, instructing, mentoring, guiding, so that these individuals who are maybe not contributing to society uh, can learn how to contribute to society. I'm a conservative by, by nature and my political philosophies. Um, and one of the things that I talk a little bit about is even in the, uh, the, the penal system is uh, I believe that we should be educating these people. Like we, they need education. They need to learn how to start businesses. They need high school diplomas or equivalents. They need the information. They need the knowledge. They need the mentorship. They need the tutor, tutoring and instructing because if we don't create that for them, then we just leave a void and a path for them to go back into their previous life, which doesn't serve anybody in society. So the answer is always educate, educate, mentor, coach, yep. guide, instruct, lead. It's always the answer. Yeah, love that. Uh, speaking of education, we're obviously a self-development podcast. You're huge on self-mastery. I think I watched a YouTube video of yours where you talked about a couple of years ago, you gave like 200 books away. This guy guess was filling up too much. So, yeah. so my question is, when did you start your self-mastery or self-development journey? And then do you have, besides your book, Sovereignty, do you have a book that you would maybe point people to, a book, a podcast, or something, maybe MLS CDs, that you feel like really helped you start to take off in self-development? Yeah, so, I, so to answer your first part of that question, when did I start? on the self-development journey. I, I would say it was when I was listening to those CDs by Ed Milet and old time CDs, you know, with, with sales and positive thinking and greatest salesman in the world. And as a man thinketh, Zig I was Ziggler. listening yep. to this stuff on CD. Yeah. Zig Ziglar. Yeah, exactly. All of the stuff. Um, that was probably eight, nine years ago. And it isn't coincidence. That's, that's actually when my life started to get better, you know? So, oh, yeah. Um, but since then, you know, CDs are, are not a thing anymore. <laughs> so I'm listening to books and, and, and um, audio books, reading books. I just picked up a new one I'd actually suggest. It's by Paulo Coelho. He wrote uh, The Alchemist, but he just wrote a new book the end of last year, I believe, called The Archer. And it's a quick read. I actually found it in an airport the other day. And I just, I, it, it looked interesting. I'm into archery. So I'm like, oh, I'll buy that book. I like Paulo. So I bought that book and I read it on an hour and 15 minute flight home. So it's a very quick read. But um, he, he talks about this, uh, this master archer who doesn't compete anymore and a young man trying to compete with him to prove that he's better and a young boy that observes the competition. And then the master archer is teaching this young boy lessons through the way of the archer. It's actually really interesting. So I, I really liked, in fact, I, when I got home, I picked up on Amazon 10 copies because there's people I want to give those books to. Okay. That's another way to add value to people's lives like yep. you were talking about earlier and stay connected. Um, so that's a great book. Uh, As a Man Thinketh is one, is like a default, like go-to for me uh, by James Allen. Uh, there's another book called uh, Endurance by Alfred Lansing, I believe. Uh, it's about uh, Ernest Shackleton's ill-fated uh, attempt to cross the uh, Antarctic on foot. That one, it, so it's a real story. It's a true story. It's just amazing. I did a Spartan Agogi, which is a 60-hour endurance event several years ago. And one of the recommended reading for that was to read that book before we came out. And that transformed my life. Um, what else? Wild at Heart by John Eldridge is a great book. Actually completely revolutionized the way that I look, not only at masculinity, but specifically myself. Now it's called Wild at Heart. Mm-hmm. Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink is a great book. I mean, there's just, there's just so much good information out there. I've got a ton of books back there. I've got a bunch there. I've got 20 sitting on my desk, 20 on my nightstand I haven't read. They're everywhere. Right. There's always such great information. There is. Yep. And like you said, education, you know, and if uh, and surrounding yourself with people, if like we can't obviously surround ourselves face to face with somebody like you, but we can listen to Order of Man. And it's just, it's again, it's it's that stuff rubbing off where we can buy your book. Um, so yeah, we're obviously huge proponents of the self-development side. So thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Well, next time, well, next yeah, time we course. record a podcast with them, we'll probably be in studio together. Yeah, right? we're going to be there. <laughs> Let's do it, man. Where, do so it. where are you guys, where are you guys located? We're, yeah, we're here in St. Louis. So Andy Frisella is like our, oh, yeah. our guy. So that's, that's our guy we want to have on pretty bad. So, you know, we yeah. had, we had Emily and we, we have you. We're pretty excited. We got Ben Newman lined up here on a couple of weeks oh, in cool. studio. So uh, we got a lot of cool. He's been there in St. Louis as well. He is. He's from St. Louis. So yeah. I mean, the cool. last three weeks, what he picked up a Super Bowl and a national championship. So uh, that'll be a cool conversation to have with him. But yeah, something sure. something we always do on every podcast is we have our only fan inquiry, 
that, you know, somebody reaches out and asks us a question. So we thought it would only be fitting that we reached out to our listeners to see if they had a question for you. So the question okay. that we have is from somebody who is actually a part of the Order of Man and Iron Council. And um, his name's Brad as well, which is ironic. That's why you picked it. That is why I picked it. <laughs> but um, what he wanted to know is what is the one thing that the people that are a part of Order of Man and Iron Council, if they figured out sooner, would help them? I mean, I, I've got a thousand answers already. I'm I just bet. Trying to pick yeah. Them. Like, what is the one? Because it's never one thing, right? Like, it matters for if every If it was person. that, it would be easy. Yeah. It's never one. It's usually a combination of things. And you have to, here's what I would say. I would say, start planning out your day. That's great. One. That's it. Like, that is. I mean, really, it's if, you can, that, if really. you can just, really, it truly is. Like, if you can figure out a way, I don't care if it's a planner like we have here. Or, I mean, I've got stuff like this everywhere. Like, I've got journals and planners and notes on my phone. But if you can find a system for planning out every day, I think you're going to be more excited about getting up early because you actually have a plan. You're going to be more focused. You're going to get more done. You're going to see the fruits of, of your efforts. You're going to be more excited. You're going to be energized. Like I know when I wake up at, you know, seven or eight o'clock, I'm not quite as energized as if I wake up at six, five thirty, and get everything done early. But that all comes down to planning. So I would say have a system for planning out your day, executing your day, being consistent with it. And I, I think that'll radically change anybody's life. It really will. Yep. Love it. That's awesome. I really appreciate you joining us today. I mean, I, I, I've listened to your podcast. Collins listened to it. We turned Matt on to it. Um, there's a lot of good stuff out there. And, you know, I encourage everybody, you know, they're like, oh, what's a good podcast to listen to? I mean, obviously we say ours first, but uh, you're, always my, yeah, you're always my second one. I would one, not have you know. it any other way. And yeah. I, don't know, I don't know if this is flattering to you or not, but to, to me, um, having you on was was pretty big compared to, you know, Andy Frisella was always our, our guy that, you know, kind of got us jump started. Like, let's do a podcast. You know, we listen to Andy all the time. And when I found you, yeah. I mean, I burned through like 20 episodes. I mean, it was like, this is this is everything that I needed to hear at the time as a, as a young father, as a business owner, and, and somebody that just wants to be a better man and provider in general. So I, I appreciate everything that you're throwing out there. I appreciate you joining us. And, you know, next time uh, we'll get together on it. Let's do it. I'm all about that. Doing it face-to-face -face is way better than doing it remotely. So we'll, we'll make that happen for sure. Couldn't Sounds agree good. more. We appreciate you being on again. Right. I got one more thing before you yeah. go, man. I, I wanted to thank you sure. too. Uh, I really appreciate everything that you do and the content that you put out, man. You're, you're as real as it thank gets. You. And uh, when, when Brad found you, you know, I, I, had, I had listened to you, I think a couple years back, I found you on YouTube or something. Um, I was at a crossroads in my life too. Uh, me and my fiance now we we were we were split up and I was kind of mm. doing the same thing. Nothing was my fault, you know, or not nothing, but most things weren't my fault, and I wasn't taking the right responsibility. And I was, uh, and this is very specific, but I was shoveling my grandma's driveway, and I was sitting there thinking, I was like, he makes so much sense, you know. I was like, I just need to take a little bit more responsibility if this is something that I want, you know. Like I need to take more responsibility and just have that conversation with her. So in a way, you're kind of the reason why we're still together today. You know, if you really think hey, about it. <laughs> I, I pre well, you know, look, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take the compliment. I do appreciate that, but I commend you for doing the work. Cause I'll tell you for every one of you, there's a thousand who hear something that could be advantageous for them and they don't implement that shit ever. No. So well done doing it yourself. And thank you, you created that. So that's awesome. Thank you, man. Thanks for, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks guys. Take care, buddy. Have a good one. All right. Talk soon. Yep.